my wife was sharing something with me earlier uh, about uh, the Hebrew language is, is written and designed uh, to be expressed in pictures. In pictures. And, uh, and this psalm is no different. It's, it expresses a thought and it uses pictures and examples. And this is a very short psalm, three verses. <clears throat> you might be familiar with it. Um, but we're going to take a look at it tonight. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it's a very important psalm uh, for us, and I think it's a psalm that many of us uh, do not fully understand. And I don't say that to condemn anybody, or I just think that there's a principle here of unity that we have a concept of what unity is, but I don't know if we've ever delved really far into what true unity is in the body of Christ, um, in our marriages, in our families, in our relationships. What does it mean? Uh, so we want to look at that tonight and uh, take a look at it. So we'll read the psalm and then we'll look at a few other portions. Psalm uh, 133, a, a song of degrees of David. Uh, it's, a, it's a psalm of ascents, like when they were going up to the temple. They're, they're, the uh, psalms of ascents, uh, different psalms that they would sing as they were going there to sacrifice and, and uh, the different festivals and feasts uh, that they would go to. Uh, but this is another one of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So David is talking about unity, he's observing unity, he's thinking about unity, and maybe after we've learned so much about David and what he went through personally in his family and with his country men and the rebellion of Absalom and the, the people going against him, all of that, um, that David uh, came to a place where he could appreciate what unity, true unity is. I mean, he, maybe he thought he had it in his family and it turned out he didn't. Maybe he thought there were, there were counselors and friends of his that he could rely on, even when at the, the, um, the story of Ziklag, when the, the enemy came and took all of his wives and kids and burned the city with fire. David's own men, his mighty men, that, that were, made a vow to be with David uh, and stuck with David, they picked up stones to stone him, you know. So, you know, David might be, be, have, be contemplating what true unity is here. Sometimes I think we think that unity is just us trying to get along with people. If we can get along with people, then there'll be unity. And I think that happens in, in relationships. I think it happens in marriages. I think it happens in the church. You know, I'm not going to say anything for the sake of unity. Okay, that's fine. You can say that. Uh, you know, the, the expression uh, in a marriage, you, you hear it in the world, happy wife, happy life. Well, you know, okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, if my wife is happy, then yeah, okay. But, but what is that really saying? Like, I don't want to listen to her, so I'm going to keep her happy. Is that unity between a husband and a wife? No. It's not, it's compromise. Mm -hmm. it, it's trying to get by, it's trying to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there's something beyond that. If you really want true unity, 
you should if you have, you have true unity between a husband and a wife or body members this is talking about brethren so we're talking about church people tonight um, it goes beyond just biting your tongue for the sake of keeping the peace but many times and in many ways we we operate under this principle and we and we could say well what's wrong with that it, it keeps the peace I'm not saying what's on my mind because if I do there'll be a blow up well okay that's that but then is that true unity is that really what unity is all about uh, so how good and how pleasant it is very good very pleasant when brethren can dwell together in unity what unity what unity the only unity that is important that amongst the brethren in a marriage in a family uh, the unity of the spirit is the unity that we're talking about this is found in Ephesians um, chapter 4 if you can turn there we'll look at that the entire chapter of chapter 4 of Ephesians is really dealing with unity oneness in the body uh, amongst brethren uh, we're not we don't have time to look at the whole chapter but we want to bring out what kind of unity that David is talking about here in Psalm 133. So in, in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, this is Paul speaking, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearance, you know, is not the same as biting your tongue and making somebody happy so that they, there's no conflict. That's 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 sentimentality and compromise and uh, conditional uh, behavior. This the, these characteristics here: uh, lowliness, meekness. Remember, we we spoke about meekness a few weeks back. How it's not being mamby pamby or being weak. It's just being humble before God lowliness of mind, not thinking of myself more highly than I ought to, or less than I need to, or should. Like the first verse, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, your vocation, what you do for Christ, my occupations, what I do in the world for a job, my vocation, what I do for God. You know, if I'm in a body, a local assembly, uh, then my vocation is my calling to that local assembly in whatever capacity God has me in that calling. And to walk worthy of that vocation, the word worthy to it there simply means to walk equal to it. Like, let, like if I'm called to be uh, a body member, uh, then let me be the body member. Let me operate in my calling, whatever my gift is, and we can, that's a whole other area to get into, well, what is my gift? But you have a gift. The Bible's clear on that. And to discover it and then to walk in that, not walking above it uh, or walking below it. And how do people walk below it when they think they're not worthy to do anything? They're really just, you know, uh, are self-deceived in that area because God has made us worthy and he has chosen us and it says it in this, this portion he has given us uh, members in particular in the body of Christ to do different things so to walk worthy of it equal to that call and in that walking I do it with lowliness and, and meekness and long suffering and forbearing 
which had kind of interesting terms. Uh, but if you relate it to the, the, the unity of the spirit, you begin to see what it's talking about. Like we might think of long suffering as how long do I have to put up with this person? Like this person drives me crazy. Every time I come to church, they're doing this, they're doing that. I can't, I can't stand it. I don't even want to come to church sometimes because of this. How long, God, will I have to? That's that's not the long suffering that is talking about here. Uh, that's not the, uh, that. That would be like trying to bite your tongue just to keep the peace in the in the body so nothing happens. But that's not the long suffering. Forbearing each other. Uh, it, it can mean in one sense putting up with each other, but it means also, it means accepting each other, forbearing one another. Like in the body of Christ, we have many age groups, generations, you know, we could, like some people say, well, there's nothing but old people in your church. Well, no, we have young people too. Uh, we have the Sunday school kids. Uh, we could tend to be, uh, you know, forbear the Sunday school kids, put up with them, their kids, their necessary part of the church, but I have nothing in common with them. That's silliness. Mm -hmm. Because we have something in common with the eight-year-olds and the ten-year-olds. They have Christ. We have Christ. Mm -hmm. that, that's the commonality that we have. And that's how we forbear with each other by recognizing that we have the same spirit. And we'll see that in a second. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring, you know, making it my goal, making it my purpose, being diligent about keeping the unity of the spirit. Why? Because the unity of the spirit is under attack all the time. Like the devil is always trying to cause disunity in the body of Christ. And he uses the flesh to do it. And he uses the, the sayings that we just joked about at the beginning. And he gives us a false concept or a false uh, teaching of what real unity is about. But if we really operated in the unity that Psalm 133 is talking about, in the unity of the spirit that is here, then we have to look at the unity of the Trinity in order to see true unity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The unity that they had between them. How good and how pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in that unity. Not the unity that the, that the world has come up with to try and keep peace, biting your tongue, you know, keeping people happy, walking on eggshells, all of these things that can work and have its, an effect to a point. But true unity is me operating in the, the unity of the Trinity that they had between themselves all being equal, yet submitting to one another for a cause, but all being equal, forbearing, long-suffering, lowliness, meekness. How much greater meekness do you need an example of when God became a man and, came and gave, em emptied himself in Philippians 2 of his reputation and became like a servant to men, you know? <clears throat> for what? For the will of the Father to be to, to be fulfilled, uh, the plan of salvation to be executed. Christ, who was God, John 1 and 1, and is God, submitted himself to the Father's plan, humbled himself and became a man in the, in the unity of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit was left after Christ ascended, the Holy Spirit was given to be our, our paracletos, our instructor, our comforter, uh, left here on earth. And I think the Holy Spirit really, I, you know, gets the um, short end of the stick many times, as far as glorification goes. 
Like many times we don't look at the Holy Spirit as God. But he's just that, that down payment that God left behind. No, he's, he's God, but he, in, in the unity of the Trinity, he humbled himself for the plan of the, of the Trinity, for the plan of the Father. There was humility there. And, that, and it wasn't like, uh, and this is where the good and the pleasant part comes in, it wasn't like, uh, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to, you know, just to keep the peace with the Trinity. I don't want to make waves with the Father, so I will do what he wants me to do, but I really don't want to do it. No, he really wanted to do the Father's will. When Christ was on earth, he said, I only say those things that my Father tells me to say. And I only do those things that he tells me to do. You know, that, uh, I mean, he could have said, we always marvel at the fact that while he was on the cross, you know, and in the garden, he said to Peter, Peter, what are you doing? Put your sword. Don't you think I can call down 10,000 angels right now if I want? But I don't want to because I want to fulfill the plan of the Father. I want to be unified, be one with my Father more than anything else. That, that is the good and the pleasant thing of brother and dwelling together in unity where by, uh, and I know we're not perfect, I'm not going after, be, hey, we, you know, we're all perfect at this. We're not. We're, we're in a body. That's why if you read Ephesians 4 carefully, it, it, until the unity of the faith is fulfilled, God has given us teachers and pastors uh, for the edification of the body of Christ, for the perfection of the saints, to come to this place of, of recognizing what true unity is. To have a, a place where, and, and this is why, you know, we always talk about this, that the church is not the same as a, any social club that's out there. The church is different. The body is different. Uh, because the unity of the spirit uh, is manifested in the body. And when, it, when people operate in that unity, there's no tongue biting, there's no holding back and gritting your teeth, there's no, I, oh, just give me enough, you know, grace to get through this and deal with this person. There's none of that. There's like, it, you know, in Job, um, Job, uh, I wrote down the verse, hold on. Job 41 is talking about uh, the Leviathan and giving a description of his scales and, 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 you know, how he's built and made and everything, but it talks about how his scales are so close together that you they can't even have air pass through them. You know, and it's kind of like a picture of true unity in the body of Christ, where you can be so one with each other that air can't pass through you. Never mind words, never mind behavior, never mind thoughts, not even air. I'm so one with them. I'm, there's no thought to, from me towards them in any way at all other than to, to dwell together with them in unity. And there's only one way that this can happen. But let's, let's go back. Uh, Let me finish with the Ephesians 4. Uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay. We, we could look at, say, we could take this room right now and say, we all love each other. You know, we've known each other for a while. We love each other. Uh, we, we, you know, um, and that's good. But well, how about the church down the street? How about the church that, that they, they, there's a church on the other side of Peabody and they, they preach Christ and they preach the gospel, but they also do a, so do a little some things that we would never do, you know. But yet they love Christ. There, there's one God, and there's one body, and there's one faith, 
and there's one baptism. Yet, uh, we barely talk to other churches. We barely interact with them because we keep looking at the difference instead of looking at the commonality that we have. And I'm, I'm not talking about like churches that are preaching uh, a false gospel and not preaching Christ crucified and all of that, but we have enough, enough um, scripture to tell, tell us what a true church is and what isn't. Uh, and if somebody has a liking towards uh, doing something that we don't do, but if we both believe in, the, in the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and salvation, and redemption, and grace by that, but they just maybe believe or act a different, different way, why can't we fellowship with them? Why don't we fellowship with them? This is the, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, brethren, you don't say just the brethren in Peabody, just the brethren in Marlboro, just the brethren that are in this church over here. No, brethren, all brethren. No matter where you go in the world, if there's somebody that is a, a believer in Christ, you should be able to be unified with that person in Christ. And, 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 and not have it be, well, I can't fellowship with them because there's a language barrier. Yeah, okay. It might, it might take a little extra effort, but you can actually fellowship with people even with a language barrier. When there's Christ there, you can. There's a way to do it. And the, 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 there is a life in the body. It's where God commands the blessing. So, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and to all and in you all. And I often... When I read this portion I, and I read Psalm 133, I, I just wonder what God thinks about us sometimes. Like what, because it seems to me like the biggest issue in the church uh, in general is the disunity that exists amongst us. The inability of us to fellowship with other churches because they act a little different. Uh, you know, it's something we got to take a look at in our hearts. Or, or then take it into the body of, of our group in itself and say, well, I, I get along with so-and-so, so we sit together and we talk and we have this in common. But what about the person on the other side? Well, my, how do they ever talk to them? I don't really know them. Why? Why? They have the same spirit. They have the same God. They, they have the same faith. You know, they're, oh, they're not my age. They're, there's a generational problem there. Well, why? Because you're making those things the issue of unity when that's not what unity is about whatsoever. The unity that, that is talking about in the Bible, and, uh, and that if we could get a hold of it in our hearts and with each other, it's a unity whereby we are looking at a plan, God's plan for our life at the time we're living in and the place we're living at, and my occupation uh, is with that plan and our vocation, what we're called to do. I, I don't, I don't want to be occupied with somebody's personality, uh, somebody's fault, somebody's uh, difference than the way I happen to think or feel and day. I just want to be occupied with the unity of the Trinity. And what is the Trinity and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? What is their plan for our lives? What is their, the, what is that goal? What is that vision? What is that purpose? If we're occupied with those things, then all those other things, we, they, go, they go by the board. We don't see them. And, and, and it's really a mindset that we have to get to a place where we look at. Go back to uh, the, uh, Psalm 133, verse 2. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. I, I looked up this ointment. It, you know, it had to have some, there must have been something about it that David 
uh, looked at unity of the brethren and it reminded him of this oil. You know, so in Exodus chapter 30, uh, if you can turn there, I know we're jumping around, but but I think this this has kind of says something about this. Um, the anointing oil that God uh, instructed Moses to make for the anointing of the priest. Okay, uh, in Exodus 30, verse 22, Moreover the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto the principal spices of pure myrrh five hundred shekels, of sweet cinnamon half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil olive, or olive oil, a hen, a hen which was like five and a half quarts, okay. Uh, the weight of these spices, 500, 500, 250, it was like a recipe. It's a re however much that 500 shekels bought, this is the recipe of this oil, okay? These are the ingredients. Thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all his vessels, and the candlestick and all in his vessels, and the altar of the incense, and the altar of burnt offerings with all his vessels, and the labor and his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off. Okay, this oil was not like um, any other oil that they had. This was God's recipe for anointing the high priest, uh, and this is this is the picture that Moses, I mean, that David gets. What is, what is true unity like? It is like the anointing oil that only can be used on the high priest. It only has, it can only be made this way. Like you could have said, well we could, I, I was looking at this, I said, well I could come up with those oils and make, make the anointing. No, you're not allowed to do that. It's a holy anointing oil uh, just for the high priest. You remember the story of when when Mary came into Jesus with the alabaster box? It was full of myrrh. It wasn't this this recipe. It was just the myrrh, just one of these ingredients. And it said the fragrance filled the room. It just it permeated the whole room. Can you imagine the smell of this? I mean, David's picturing the smell, uh, and he's comparing unity with this smell. Overwhelming beautiful smell, holy unto the Lord, sanctified, separated. It was different than any other oil that they had. It, was, it would, could only be used by the high priest, but it was used, and when it was time to use it, it was put on everything, and, and anything that it touched became holy unto God. Anything that it touched. So this isn't any... This, this oil is a representation uh, of unity. Like, we could come up with unity on our own. We could try and get along with people. We could try and, and 
you know, bite our tongues and we could have this getting along type thing, get a, you know, go along and get along, all this stuff, and we could get by with that, or we could have true unity, which is like this oil. It's a sanctified, most holy unity. It goes beyond the flesh. It, it, it's not made for the flesh. It's not made for people. The unity that God wants us to have is not so that we can get along with each other and not kill each other. It's so that we can promote the Holy Spirit and the plan of God to the world as a body, as, an, as a, a, a group of believers that are one in Christ and have the same Father. And as a person who, who I don't have to to struggle in this unity, I have it because you have Christ and I have Christ. And that's what my focus is. And in the body of Christ, we can't afford to have petty differences and personality reports and party spirits or anything like that because you can do that anyplace else. That's the regular oil. You can get that anywhere else you want to get. But in the body, this, this picture is this is the only place that you can see this kind of fragrance, that you can see this kind of odor unto God that is sanctified and holy. It's the, it's the goodness and the pleasantness of the body dwelling together. It is like that ointment. It reminded David of that ointment, but not only that, it reminds God of that. When God sees us dwelling together with that purpose and that heart and that mindset so that we don't see each other after the flesh, as it says in 2 Corinthians, that we, know, we don't know each other after the flesh, we only know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that, that's how we, we, and I'm not saying we have, again, we're not perfect, and we, we, that's what repentance is for. But we, we should have this mindset that God has called us to a, a, like have an unction from the Holy One, which is, again, it's an oil, a smearing. And, and He has called us to, to go beyond what the world calls unity, to go beyond what we might think unity is in our marriage. Imagine bringing this unity into your marriage. Imagine bringing it into your family. Imagine having a type of relationship where your goal and your purpose is not to prove that you're right in an argument or a disagreement and to show them who's right and who's wrong, but just to have love be manifested. And because that's the only way, really, the love of Christ can be manifested is if there's no other, uh, um, no other, um, what's that? I can't think of the word, uh, motive, no other motive in it at all. I'm not trying to prove anything, I just want Christ to be exalted. I don't have to, to, to walk on eggshells or, or like do all these things so that my wife will be happy or husband, you could reverse that. Uh, you got to be quiet today because if I say anything he's going to yell, but no, that's gone. That's the old, the regular oil that you try and work around, but here it's the holy uh, anointing oil of God that He, because of His presence and His institution of unity, has set it apart. And anything that that oil touches becomes holy. That's amazing to think about. Anytime I bring the unity of Christ into an area of my life, it becomes sanctified, holy. Because I'm not in it, and you're not in it. Christ is in it. And so Christ is magnified and lifted up, and you have the unity of the Trinity. And that's when things begin to be able to happen in these areas of your life. Because striving isn't there. Struggling isn't there. Uh, personality problems aren't there. Christ is there. And that's it. And the other thing he compares this unity to is the dew on Mount Hermon, uh, extending all the way to Mount Zion. And that's a picture again of the Hebrew language. The dew on Mount Hermon was Mount Hermon was the highest mountain in Israel. And, and, and people that have camped on Mount Hermon have said, when you get up in the morning, your tent is soaked. 
because the dew is so thick on that mountain. But it's like it rained all night. That's how wet everything is. And, and, and then it, it says that, that that dew extends all the way to Mount Zion, which is a hundred miles south in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and it's one of the smaller mountains. And it's a word picture of, of Christ coming down. Christ who came from heaven and became a man. <coughs> he came from Mount Hermon, if you will, and he came, became a man. And he dwelt among men, and he brought that presence with him, that do in his life. It's, it's a word picture of, of the bread of life coming down from heaven for us. It, it's always a picture of God coming down for us, to bless us, and bringing the presence of God uh, with him and extending it to us, Mount Zion. Mount Zion is where what the tabernacle, the temple was. <coughs> it's where the church is, the people of God. And I, I, I want to read a, a, a chapter from this this book again, the great, these books are so good about uh, this unity because I think this was a, a kind of an interesting paragraph. And this guy here is quoting Eugene Peterson, who's, who's a really good author, uh, but he says this, the gospel is never for individuals, but always for a people writes Eugene Peterson, sin fragments us and separates us and sentences us to solitary confinement. The gospel restores us, unites us, and sets us in community. Believers know nothing of a secret individualized faith. This is interesting. Believers know nothing of a secret individualized faith, yet there are many believers who think they have something special with God. You know? Uh, Christ is not seen apart from the gathered, listening, praying, believing, worshiping people to whom he is the Lord and Savior. It is not possible to have Christ apart from the church. That statement, I like had to read that ten times. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it possible to have Christ apart from the church, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all in Ephesians? Yes, I have Christ, but can I have Christ without the church? Like, not saying it's a condition of my salvation, but where do we see Christ in the church? Where does brethren dwell together in unity in the church? It, it, when they're gathered together. When do we gather together? When we go to church. When we gather together to worship God. And the manifestation of God is presence there, and the anointing of God comes in. Okay? So, Following Jesus without being in the church is like a soccer player without a team, an actor without an audience, a symphony conductor without an orchestra, a teacher without students. You get the point. Okay? It's kind of true. If, I, if I'm a lone ranger and I won't fellowship with the body of Christ, then I'm missing out on something because the body of Christ is is the, the, the fullness of him that filled all in all. We are members in particular where Christ is the head, and the foot cannot say to the hand, I don't have a need for you. And that's when true unity comes into play, when, when the foot tries to say to the hand, I don't need you, something's wrong. I, I can get along without you. I don't even need a church. I can worship God by myself. This, but no, really, in reality, you can't. Because you're lacking something that God has instituted where his presence is manifested through the anointing oil that touches everything that it touches becomes holy unto the God. And where did he have it anointed? In the church, in the tabernacle. And, and that's where his presence was. And so, yes, I, I bring Christ with me to my, in my life, but I fellowship in the body. 
My faith uh, is heard in, in, by the preaching of the word, and that happens in the church, the system that God set up. And this isn't, I'm not doing, saying this message tonight to top on people coming to church. I'm just saying it's a principle of true unity and getting us to a place where we stop looking at unity as a, a, a human concept where we try to get along with everybody, instead enter into the unity of the Trinity whereby God has a life. And when he sees the unity of the brethren, it says there is where he commanded the blessing, mm -hmm. even life forevermore. Mm -hmm. You know? And so, I, God has called us as a group to, to serve him in this, in our, with our vocation in the, this local assembly. As a church worldwide, we are on a mission to share Christ with the world. And so we can go anywhere in the world and find true believers in fellowship with them in the unity of the Trinity. And it, they could be older than me, younger than me, a different color than me. They could have a different viewpoint on certain things than I do. They could eat different food than I do. None of that is a reason for me to say, I don't have a need for them. Because I do. Because I do. Because I, I, there, there might be a member in particular that has a portion for me that I need so desperately. And I, because I have a mindset that I don't need every portion of the body, then I never experienced that. And if I'm not experiencing that, then do I have true unity of the Trinity? I do not. I do not. Christ humbled himself and fulfilled the Father's will and was in total unity with God while he did that. The Holy Spirit humbled himself and was in total unity with Christ and with God and has stayed behind to instruct us and teach us. But they are so united in this thing that there isn't ever, and through all the thousands of years, there isn't ever an issue with the Trinity on this. They were one in eternity past, they will be one in eternity forever, however long that is, in the plan of God, in the thought of God, in the purpose of God. There will never be war uh, a civil war between the Trinity. There will never be backbiting or, or jealousy or anything like that in the Trinity of God. There's total oneness. And that oneness has been extended to us. One Father, one faith, one baptism, one body. Right? And, and, and we're part of it. And so, I... I'm left with this three verses and this beautiful word picture of the anointing oil and saying that it's so different than anything else we could come up with, this oil. Like I could get those, those things and I could make up the oil myself and say, wow, I have the anointing oil here. The recipe is right in the scripture. I have cinnamon, I have calamus, I have this, and there was a... a a thing where uh, until recently they didn't have the, the calamus and they found it, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so that they can make the anointing oil now. But they're not going to until they're ready to sacrifice in the temple. Mm -hmm. and, and because it's part of prophecy. You know, so, mm -hmm. but, but I could make that uh, I, I think I came up with something, but that's not what makes it holy is God. It's God that sanctified and said, this is a holy oil, and anything it touches is holy. And it, it, it's not for men. It's not for flesh. What does that mean? It's for the body. And the body is it's saying that the body isn't the flesh manifesting itself. It's the spirit that is in us being manifested. And that's what separates us from the world. And what people can understand or whatever, whatever they say, but it, I, I really think this, you know, personal belief, uh, that if we understood this principle, this church would be full tonight. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just knocking our church, every church would be full tonight. Mm -hmm. If we really understood the principle of the unity of the Spirit, 
and the presence of the Spirit and the holy anointing that comes upon the members in particular because God has sanctified us like he sanctified the oil and everything we touch becomes holy. If we really understood that, we would be craving it and desiring it to be in that presence all the more. And we wouldn't even have time to think, oh, is that person, you know, do I need that person? Should I talk to them? Should I try? Should I? No, we shouldn't try, and we shouldn't do this, and we shouldn't bite our tongue. We should just, like, love people with Christ's love. Mm. Focus on the presence of God. Let God work through us towards people, and them in their vocation towards us. True unity. It's something to, to really think about in your heart tonight. And, and to not settle for fake unity. You know, bring true unity into your marriage and see what happens. When there's no expectation of your spouse. Because the only reason you, you have one with them is because of the love of Christ. Not because they took out the trash on time this week. Not because they, they cooked your favorite meal. Not because... No, all that's fine. I'm not coming against any of that. But that's just a manifestation of love. Not, I have to do this to keep the peace. You see the difference? Yes, and that's what true unity in the body is. It's like just us loving each other with the love of Christ, with no expectation, and no, no animosity, and no hidden agendas, and none of that to worry about. And so what does that produce in me? But it produces... A, a goodness and a pleasantness that people see and they want to be a part of. That's true unity in the body. Amen. 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 Okay, let's pray. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, if you're watching tonight and you, you don't know Christ as your Savior, come to know Him as your Savior. Accept Him into your heart. Be one with God in your heart. It has nothing to do with your sin. He died for your sin. It has nothing to do with whether you're good enough. You're not. Neither am I. It has to do with receiving His love into your life. Receive Christ as your Savior tonight. Ask Him to come into your heart, and He will. And He will reveal to you uh, this unity that we're talking about. Father, help us to see it. Lord, help us to pursue it. Help us to, to be diligent, Lord, to pursue it, to endeavor to keep it in our heart, Lord. It can escape us so easily. We're so frail, Lord, and we're so weak. And we can look at people's flesh, and we can look at things, and we can, can get out of focus with what you really have for us in, in true unity, Lord. Help us to see what David saw when brethren dwell together in unity. Lord, help us to see the anointing oil and how special it is, Lord, and how sweet smelling it is to you, how it reaches up even to heaven. It's a mystery, but it did. You smelt it. You knew of it. Lord, you designed it to be that way. Uh, help us, Lord, to, be, to reflect that, that odor to people in our lives, Lord that whatever we touch becomes sanctified. Not because it's us, Lord, but because it's your presence in us, Lord. This holy anointing, rima and unction uh, from the Holy One, Lord, that you've given us, Lord. And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay, thanks for joining us tonight on Facebook.